Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So first of all, I would like to congratulate the, the organizers, especially for the choice of the, the sequence of topics. Because this morning we heard about uh, things that uh, we know about and we, we see, large scale structures, CMB, and so on. Then we move to gravitational waves, which are things that at least we know about. And uh, although we haven't detected them yet directly, we are, we are pretty sure of, of what we are talking about. And now, my task is to talk about astrophysical signals of dark matter. And uh, I must admit, I'm not completely sure that we know what we are talking about, uh, neither that uh, there should be any uh, such signals. So um, hopefully, you're, you'll be patient uh, and um, um, understand also the, the structure of the, the three lectures that I, I, I decided at the end. Um, basically, uh, the plan is the following. Uh, today, lecture one, I will try to focus on, on uh, some basic notions, OK? These are notions, say, of cosmology, of uh, kinetic theory, and thermodynamics that probably most of you are familiar about. But I will need some of these notions in the following. So uh, maybe this will be a bit boring, but hopefully short. Then I will uh, insist a bit on the evidence Then we have uh, about dark matter. Uh, astrophysical and cosmological evidence. So ideally, the first lecture today is I, I'm talking about things we, we are pretty certain about. Okay, um, and then uh, some basic properties that we can infer from uh, astrophysics and cosmology, and uh, uh, more or less this will conclude uh, today uh, today lecture. Then I will move on lecture two. The real issue, as you will be uh, aware soon, is that actually in order for, uh, to search for signals of dark matter, we should agree more or less on what we should be looking for. Uh, so this is one main difference with respect to the gravitational wave case. So uh, uh, it's unavoidable that if you want to go beyond these basic uh, uh, properties, um, you, you need some framework. So I will introduce the, the most common framework uh, for, uh, for uh, dark matter, uh, the thermal relic framework, or sometimes you know the WIMP concept, and I'll discuss um, uh, some some implication of that. Uh, I will also discuss some uh, uh, generalization, something beyond this uh, this uh, uh, this framework. So um, exception, let's call them. Or alternatives very shortly, um, and uh, just to mention that they exist, and I will also introduce some more advanced notions on uh, on the Boltzmann equation. Uh, I mean the full uh, momentum dependent Boltzmann equation that uh, for thermal wimps mostly is useful for computing. Uh, um, cross sections and uh, decay rates and so on and so forth, uh, but in general, for some alternatives, are crucial uh, in order to to infer the momentum distribution of your particle and uh, related quantities. And then in lecture two, I will also spend some time on uh, direct detection. I still consider that some astrophysical signal of dark matter. Again, not very advanced. Uh, what I tried to do was to have a quick look at your background, your research interests. So I think that there is only a minority of people that is really particle physics oriented and uh, in model building, for instance. So I, I, I decided to, to, to give you some notions on that so that next time you see a plot, an exclusion plot, or a search plot of direct detection, you know the physics behind it, at least. And then um, in lecture three, I will really uh, devote to indirect dark matter. Here I should say mostly WIMPs, although I will, I will uh, describe some exception to that, uh, searches. OK, uh, so I will talk about uh, high energy probes of dark matter, for example, gamma rays, uh, neutrinos. Uh, I will describe uh, cosmic rays like uh, positrons or electrons or antiprotons some notions on uh, CMB searches, and so on and so forth. 
Okay, so that's the plan. And uh, let's start with some notion. It will be hybrid, so I'll try to, to make some point on Blackboard and use slides, uh, especially since it's unclear if you can read it and retain. In any case, I will make the slides available, so uh, you don't have to worry if you miss some line. There will be references to textbook, to reviews, to research articles, and there will be also in the slides some exercise that uh, some exercises that I propose you to to check if the notions I've introduced are clear enough for you to have an operational, hands-on uh, understanding of what, I, what I've been doing. So um, about these notions of cosmology that we need, I apologize to those of you who are, should be the majority that are familiar with them, but I will need some notions on uh, smooth cosmology in the early universe. Uh, and basically, uh, what you should uh, be aware of is the so-called whole Big Bang picture in the sense that if we track back what we know today uh, in the early universe, we expect to have a, a situation where the inhomogeneities were much uh, uh, less important and uh, uh, you had a hotter universe, okay? So hot that in reality in the early universe it was uh, a plasma and could be even a very hot plasma. So uh, the basis of that is the classical cosmological um, evidence like the Hubble law, uh, like the CMB, like the primordial nucleosynthesis. If you are really unfamiliar with those topics, at a qualitative level at least, uh, please just interrupt me. But I won't spend time on that. I will just need this, this concept. If you have no problem whatsoever with the fact that the universe early on was hot and uh, uh, basically everything was well described by a smooth uh, uh, fluid or plasma, uh, or a, a sum, a combination of plasma, then, then it's okay. Um, the, the other, the other uh, idea I need from classical cosmology is the, the cosmological principle. So on large scales nowadays, it's, it's stated like, uh, uh, it's a statement of uh, isotropy and, uh, and uh, uh, homogeneity uh, in a statistical sense on very large scales. Uh, in the early universe, in fact, this is, uh, this is supposed to be much more uh, close to, to truth. Uh, in uh, both quantitatively and uh, on, uh, on uh, scale uh, dependence. Um, and then, um, what can I... Okay, another notion that I will need is the fact that we can describe uh, many properties of these plasmas, of this combination of particles in the early universe um, in terms of a distribution function, okay? just like the ones you have probably seen in uh, kinetic theory or statistical physics. This is a very delicate concept, in fact, because uh, we are dealing with a system, the universe, which is expanding. So uh, by itself, this is not, uh, uh, this is not a static uh, system, and it's not even a stationary system, in fact, and it's unclear to what extent you can use thermodynamics or even classical kinetic theory to describe it. Uh, so, uh, in principle, in order to describe many physical phenomena in this system, you need uh, non-equilibrium uh, tools in statistical physics or even in quantum field theory. Uh, but for, um, for most applications, and basically all of the ones I'll treat, uh, I'll treat today, uh, uh, it's enough to, to invoke local thermodynamical uh, equilibrium. So let me just uh, sketch what I mean. And in parallel, you have the, the, the slides here. So uh, what I mean is that uh, uh, the microscopic processes, uh, exchanging momentum, exchanging energy, exchanging number of particles, are, can ha have uh, much faster rates than, than the expansion rate of the universe. So although uh, you have different patches of the universe which are not in causal contact, Basically, uh, if you start from uh, close enough conditions, um, you end up with, uh, with the same kind of effective temperature shared in a causally disconnected uh, region. So locally, you have a sort of equi equilibrium that is established, and you know that uh, uh, the distribution function, so uh, if you wish the occupation number in phase space, is described uh, in, in, uh, in general in, in quantum statistics, by a distribution which, in general, as I said, should be dependent on time, on position, and on momentum, which is either the, the 
the Fermi Dirac 1 plus or minus 1 plus for Fermi Dirac 1 minus for uh, Bose Einstein. Um, and uh, um, although in this broader sense you can think of these uh, uh, two parameters, mu and, ta and, and, and the temperature, as uh, effective parameters which just enforce uh, the maximum entropy configuration consistently with the, 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 um, the energy in your system and uh, the number of particles that are present in your system. And in fact, because of the cosmological principle, uh, the fact that we know that we cannot depend, the properties of our system cannot depend on the position because of homogeneity and uh, cannot depend on the direction because of isotropy. In fact, this is only a function of time and uh, energy, or if you wish, of the uh, modulus of the, the momentum. Okay? This is the first uh, uh, concept I will need for the, for the following. Uh, then, uh, once you accept that, uh, there is a, a, a more rigorous uh, justification of that in, for example, in Mukhanov's uh, textbook. Um, once you accept that, you can deal with this uh, distribution function. Basically, for those of you who are not familiar at all, what I mean by that is that if you integrate this function over a given volume and a, a given a range in momentum, you get the number of particles of that species having the momentum in that range and occupying that volume, okay? Um, so once you are uh, familiar with that and you accept that, you can use basic kinetic equilibrium notions. For example, particles that can freely exchange uh, energy between each other, they will share this parameter, the temperature of your system, or particles which are uh, mutually related by uh, particle number changing interaction, well, they have uh, some conservation rule for the chemical potential. For example, if you have a reaction A plus B that goes in C plus D, and this is at equilibrium, which means in our context, this is fast enough with respect to the expansion of the universe, this implies that these parameters satisfy a, a relation like that. Mu C plus mu D. And similarly, for example, if you have uh, uh, particles which are their own uh, uh, antiparticles, like photons, well, they are characterized by vanishing mu, uh, and uh, particles and antiparticles, they have opposite uh, uh, chemical potential, say, for example, E plus, E minus, you know that at some point they are in equilibrium through uh, pair production and, and annihilation. So since this has vanishing chemical potential, it means that they must have opposite chemical potential and so on. So these are probably familiar from a basic uh, kinetic theory, but they cannot be applied at a local level uh, in the early universe, and because of the uh, hypothesis of the cosmological principle, you can extend uh, uh, globally, although there was no necessarily uh, causal contact uh, among these patches. Um, another notion that uh, um, is important is that for some calculation in cosmology, you don't need to know uh, the whole uh, distribution function. Okay? It's sufficient to have some partial information. Again, this is something you are probably familiar uh, with from uh, from uh, gas dynamics or fluid dynamics, uh, it's sufficient to deal with some moments of your uh, complete distribution function. And again, you can define them in, uh, in uh, a relativistic uh, framework. For instance, you can define uh, the generalization of particle number and current and mu just by defining, uh, okay, in general you have the number of internal degrees of freedom of your particle and then the integral over the phase space of your distribution function times what? Well, first momentum, so P mu over P zero. P mu is the form momentum. Of course, because of the, because of the, um, sorry, this should be there. Because of the cosmological principle only in the, in the frame of the, the CMB, uh, only the zero component of this four vector is non-vanishing, so at the end, uh, this will be uh, basically for the i component, this will be ni equal zero, and for the zero component, this will just give you g integral over d cube 
P 2 pi cube F P0 over P0. So this is the conventional number density of your particle. OK? And then uh, identities you are probably familiar from, uh, with from, from GR, for example, Bianchi identity. which loosely speaking for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, sort of conservation of uh, energy where this is the stress energy tensor. Uh, well, it, it will translate in terms of this quantity uh, we have just uh, uh, defined. Well, sorry, this is first momentum. So I shouldn't be speaking about that yet. There is a similar relation, a similar conservation law for nu mu. And later on, I will describe the Bianchi identity. Uh, so this is equivalent to a conservation law for, for, for n. So basically, it's, it, it translates in the, in the derivative of n0 times a cube in, uh, in a uh, friedman nimetric robertson walker universe equals 0, which means that n scales like e to the, a to the minus cube, where this is the scale factor. Anything of this surprises you, or it looks exotic or exoteric at all? And the same can be done for the second moments of the, the distribution. So I can erase here. For instance, you are familiar, I hope, with Einstein's equation, uh, or you have seen them. And uh, you know that at the, conventionally, at the right-hand side, you have the stress energy tensor there, right? So how it is related to this strange beast I've introduced? Well, it's nothing but the second moment of it, OK? It's nothing but basically t mu nu is nothing but the integral times the number of degrees of freedom assumed to be equally populated for simplicity, f p mu p nu over p0. Okay, and so it's enough for Einstein's equation to have just the second moment of this uh, distribution in order to describe gravitational dynamics. Okay, um, so for instance, the the zero zero term of that will give you p zero square over p zero. So this is nothing but integral d cube p over two pi cube f times what? Times P0, which is the energy, hmm? times G. So this is nothing else but the energy density of your, of your system. And this is the 0, 0 component. Of course, 0 high component vanishes because of the cosmological principle. And then you have a high high component, which cannot depend on I being 1, 2, or 3. So all of 3 are similar, are, are, are equal, in fact. And so this can be also be written in terms of a scalar quantity times the, the Kronecker symbol. So this is called the pressure. And so uh, this will be given by integral g d cube p cube of what? Of uh, modulus of p square 3 e times f. OK, maybe since you not necessarily are seeing what, what I'm showing, I rewrite them here. Here it is. Is it clear? And then um, just a trick. Maybe this looks too abstract. So you, you may wonder, I am dealing with some cosmological situation where um, there are some processes that interest me. Could be, for example, weak physics, or could be electromagnetic processes, or what else. Um, am I close or far away from this local thermodynamical equilibrium where I can apply this machinery as it is? Well, the simplest trick to, to, estimate, to answer this question is to estimate the, the, the relevant interaction rate with respect to the, to the expansion history of the universe, the expansion rate of the universe. Okay? So in general, the, the, the evolution time, the evolving uh, dynamical scale for our universe is the Hubble rate at that epoch, of course. So this is in general dependent on time, or, or redshift, if you wish, or 
in terms of temperature, these are equivalent uh, way to describe this, uh, this dynamical uh, quantity. And you can compare it with the, the rate, the particle physics rate, which is of interest to you. So uh, the rate of a process is, can be estimated by the number density of the target of your particle, say, the, the, the rate of recombination of a, an electron with a proton to, to give you hydrogen. This is nothing but uh, can be estimated by the number density of the target protons times the cross-section for the phenomenon times the relative velocity of the two. And most of the physics of interest, at least from the astroparticle point of view, uh, in the early universe is related to the, to the, um, to the condition where this situation is verified. So in general, what happens is that the rate of particles, sorry, not this one, but the relation gamma equal h. So the typical situation is that the dependence on time or on temperature or any or redshift of the right hand side and the left hand side is different. So uh, the most frequently found situation is the, the situation in which in the early universe this gamma it may be very high and the Hubble rate is relatively low. And so basically you are in a quasi static situation and you can deal with it with standard uh, statistical physics and thermodynamical tools. Uh, however, at some point these uh, evolves uh, faster than the other one, so at some point it will decrease below the level of age, and uh, you will end up in a situation where you, you start with gamma much larger than h, it evolves through a situation where at the end gamma will be much smaller than h, and at some point it will match gamma of the order of h. Okay? This situation is basically a decoupled situation. Your particles do not interact anymore. So you don't really care about the microphysics of it. They evolve independently. Uh, here, it's called the freeze-out. Okay? So whatever kind of reaction was going on could have been annihilation of particles or could have been, uh, I don't know, um, uh, some, some equilibrium between different species uh, is not valid anymore. And this describes some departure from equilibrium. And in general, it's something interesting. So just to make this discussion a little bit um, uh, more, more specific, let me mention a couple of examples. One example you are certainly familiar with is the formation of CMB as recombination. So you can roughly estimate the time or the temperature at which this happens by quoting the rate for the process of E plus P uh, giving uh, uh, gamma a photon plus hydrogen and uh, decoding with the Hubble rate, and you end up with, with uh, uh, a typical temperature of the order of the electron volt. Or uh, uh, in the earlier universe, for example, you may estimate the, the, the temperature or the time at which the reaction of uh, proton to neutron fusion into deuterium plus gamma uh, decouples from equilibrium, so for which this these, these equality is roughly satisfied, and you end up with uh, uh, an estimate temperature of 0.1 MeV. And the same might be done for other things. For example, the, the I don't know, proton to neutron interconversion via neutrinos due to weak interaction. Okay. By the way, in both these cases, I mean, I, I leave them as an exercise. This is a very useful uh, exercise. Uh, try to do it in terms of order of magnitude first. There is something that you can do if you do not do it in orders of magnitude, but you carefully plug in the cross-section and, all, and all, the, all the numbers, it's to realize that here the temperature of relevance in both cases is well below the binding energy of your, of your uh, species. So the binding energy of deuterium is roughly 2.2 MeV, and here you have a relevant temperature which happens at roughly 0.1 MeV. And here, the, the, the binding energy is, is one order of magnitude higher, right? The ionization potential of the hydrogen. And again, you have roughly electron volt uh, temperature. And you will uh, uh, immediately realize that this, this is quite uh, common, and it's related to the high entropy of the universe, in fact. So this I leave as an exercise. If you have problems, you can come to me, and uh, we, we can go through it together. So. 
sorry for this more technical um, introduction. I think I can skip a bit on the technicalities for the, uh, the entropy. A uh, couple of things I wanted to say is that, uh, um, again, the analogous of this, uh, react this condition here for the second moment is nothing but the, the Bianchi identity. And uh, in fact, this is the, uh, the other Friedman uh, equation, the second Friedman equation, which is, if you wish, the conservation of uh, uh, energy. Okay? Um, and once you plug in, once you plug in explicit expression of the density of energy and the pressure in terms of, uh, uh, of temperature, well, this gives you a time-temperature relation. So this is why I was using before uh, equivalently the time or the redshift or the, the temperature as uh, equivalent variables in my, in my system. So is this familiar to you? Have you ever seen the Friedman quotient before? I guess so. So um, another thing that you can easily work out is the expression for the, the explicit expression for this, for example, for the number density of particles or for the energy density of particles that is reported here, uh, by plugging in the, the distribution there, the Bose Einstein or the Fermi Dirac or even the Maxwell Boltzmann limiting behavior of it. Uh, and you immediately realize that at equilibrium, I can use that, uh, that expression. Okay? So, um, in the relativistic regime, I will have very um, simple expression. For, well, yes, both in the relativistic regime and in the non-relativistic regime, I will have some uh, analytical expression for, the, uh, for these basic thermodynamical quantities. For example, the number density is nothing but the temperature cube, time, and numerical factor. You immediately see that, right? Let me just show explicitly from this expression here. Here. This can be written as g times integral dp 4 pi p square 2 pi cube. Then you have 1 over e to the e over t. I assume zero chemical potential just for simplicity, plus or minus 1. OK? And then uh, immediately, for a relativistic species, this is basically the same thing. OK? So you have a factor p cube. I can, I wrote it that way because I know that it's isotropic, okay? So at the end, I will have something which I can write as T cube time and numerical integral. Hmm? And the numbers there are just the result of this numerical integral. I'm using uh, natural units throughout, but if you have problems, we can restate them, the, all the Cs and H bar, but it will take the rest of the lecture, probably. Uh, so this numerical factor is, for example, 1 for Bose-Einstein distribution, just like the one of photons, for example, 3 fourths for the fermionic degrees of freedom. And the same you can do for the, the energy density. Of course, in the case of energy density, you have an extra factor of E. So in order to make the integral dimensionless, you have to multiply and divide by another factor of T. And that's what gives you the, the T to the fourth, OK? Times another number that you can compute. For those of you who are familiar, this is the Riemann, the, the Riemann function. And the specific value is roughly 1.2 here, OK? But it's not important. It's just a number. Now. Uh, what does it mean in terms of these uh, thermodynamic quantities, uh, for example, the energy density or the, the, the number density expressed in terms of temperature, uh, notions like the conservation of the number of particles? Again, for consistency, you know what, what you should expect. The number of particles in a, in, in a system which does nothing but evolve with the expansion of the universe should scale like the volume. Okay? And you do find that. Okay? And uh, uh, in fact, in order to preserve this, this, re this property, uh, it's equivalent to say that the temperature cube times A cube times the volume must be a constant. Okay? Because in a commoving volume of the universe, if nothing happens, the number of particles must be preserved. Which is equivalent to say that the temperature of a relativistic decoupled species should scale as 1 over A. So 
A is the expansion, uh, the, the scale factor of the universe, so uh, it's uh, directly related to the, to the redshift. So, in fact, it means that, uh, uh, for example, the CMB temperature can be used uh, interchangeably as the scale factor of the universe, or if you wish, can be used as a time variable or as a clock variable for the particle physics processes at different, at different epochs. So th these are quite trivial notions, uh, but uh, if you have never seen them before, it uh, might be quite unusual uh, to, to, to deal with temperature like time. Or, uh, uh, but it's more practical in terms of particle physics uh, notions to deal with temperatures which describe typical energies available in your system than with time. Okay. So, um, and that's it. I mean, um, the same thing that I wrote for the relativistic case, you can write for a non-relativistic species. Uh, here, in the non-relativistic limit, what happens is that, in practice, uh, you can forget about this part because this one is more relevant, and uh, you recover the, Mol the, Boltzmann, uh, the Boltzmann distribution, and as a result of the integration, for example, the number density of your particle will assume a slightly more complicated form, but still you can write down in an analytic term. The density of the species is nothing but the energy density of a species is nothing but the mass of that species times the number density, which makes sense. If you are in the non-relativistic limit, most of the energy of your particle is in its rest mass. It's not in its kinetic energy. And, uh, uh, of course, the pressure for a non-relativistic species is very, very small. Remember uh, the, the perfect gas theory, right? So this is nothing but the temperature, and the kinetic energy of your system is completely negligible with respect to the, to the mass, the rest mass. So far, so good. Uh, you can generalize to other notions that you have uh, seen in basic physics. For example, the entropy you can write down a, a density of entropy and a, an associated current. Uh, I, I, I won't prove this, but uh, uh, if you have seen Boltzmann expression for the, for the entropy, uh, well, you, you will recognize this, uh, this factor. And the only thing you have to, uh, to keep in mind is that this entropy um, basically uh, uh, scales as the density plus pressure over temperature, okay? Um, this will be, uh, will be used. In practice, you can check this relation by plugging in the, 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 the distribution function that I just wrote down uh, in the expression for the entropy um, and, uh, and work out the calculation of the integral. Uh, but the only notion that probably we'll be using in the rest of this, on this lecture is that since it evolves as rho plus p over over T, and since the entropy is dominated by the relativistic species present, it's not surprising that the entropy density goes as T cube. Why? Because rho plus P in the relativistic limit go, uh, go both as T to the fourth. P is one third of rho for the relativistic gas equation of state. So this is nothing but four thirds rho over T. Rho goes less to, the, to T to the fourth. So this is T to the cube. And there is just a numerical factor in front, which is the effective number of degrees of freedom entering the entropy expression, which for a superposition of gas, in principle, each one at different temperatures, for example, you may think of neutrinos and photons, is nothing but the sum of some algebraic expression cubed in the ratio of temperature of, this, of that gas with respect to the temperature of reference, which we assume to be the, the CMB1. And then there is a, a, a statistics factor of 7, 8 for, the, for fermions. Okay? That's not important. The important thing is that this is something cubic in, in temperature. And the other thing is that uh, at the equilibrium, this prefactor can be computed in terms of the, the species populating your plasma. Okay? Nothing more. These are just factors that you can check to be correct, but uh, nothing, nothing very fancy. And uh, um, till now, I, I never mentioned dark matter, but th these notions will be useful uh, uh, today a bit and tomorrow in particular to, to, to do some real calculation. So um, the final thing that I want to mention is that this function, uh, age uh, effective, can be generalized also for the energy density of the universe, the total energy density of the universe. 
it's not surprising that the effective number of degrees of freedom entering the energy density, now it's weighted through the fourth power of the temperature just because the, the energy density of relativistic species is weighted uh, like the fourth power of the, uh, goes as the fourth power of the temperature. And uh, uh, just to give you an idea of the, on the numerical value of these, well, it depends on the temperature of the universe, right? So it depends on the number of degrees of freedom of your plasma. And uh, uh, at very uh, low temperature, it's just, just around 11 or so. But if you go up uh, back in the history of the universe, you have uh, more and more degrees of freedom. Uh, you may grow through even all the mass of the uh, hadronic phase with lots of mesons and hadrons and so on. So this can reach much higher values. Uh, and another thing is that the ratio of the, these effective degrees of freedom ent uh, in the entropy and in the, in the uh, energy density is almost constant. It's not exactly constant because, again, when, uh, when uh, particles get out of equilibrium, for example, when uh, all these uh, mesons and hadrons uh, annihilate uh, when the temperature becomes too, too, too low, well, they are weighted slightly different, slightly differently for the density of um, uh, entropy and, and uh, uh, and then and energy, and so they, they just depart from a little bit from, from this unity. Okay, now, f a apart from the case where you work in, the, in this field and you need this notion to do detailed calculation, you will never need this kind of precision. But be aware that if you want to perform percent level accuracy calculation, you need to take into account this phenomenon. By the way, this is not even the correct formulation because all this approximation assume that only relativistic uh, stuff matters. In reality, you have some uh, weight of non-relativistic uh, component in the, in the plasma, and for some very precision calculation like primordial nucleosynthesis one, uh, you have to take into account that, okay? Um, but this, this was just uh, so that everybody is at the same uh, level in terms of basic notions. If there are questions, I might move, yes, please. Yes, it is. And the reason why this is because the number of stuff that is in the universe decreases with temperature. So the, in a certain sense, from a particle physics point of view, the early universe was, was a much more interesting place than, uh, than current universe. For example, uh, uh, you had uh, electrons and positrons in equilibrium with photons, with uh, neutrinos, and all the rest in the early universe. But now there is no more electrons and positrons, and the reason is that once the temperature drops sufficiently below the mass scale of the electron positrons, what happens is that I can, uh, I can erase this one, perhaps. What happens is that reactions like E plus, E minus going into gamma gamma are way more favored with respect to reactions of gamma gamma going into E plus E minus. Hmm? Why? Because the typical energy of these gammas is well below the level of the mass of the electron, so they don't have enough kinetic energy to produce them. And so as a result, this stuff goes into photons, so to speak. So the number of species changes. Of course, there is some conservation law that you can account for, and this is the, the whole trick is just to account for for this bookkeeping of species that have disappeared from the plasma. But the number of species in the plasma does decrease. Uh, of, of course, this depends on the, the properties of the world we live in. But uh, other questions? OK. Sure. I got confused the first time I saw this thing. So I hope it means that you have seen them before. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask. For example, maybe, maybe I, can, I, I can do an example of what, what it is, the, the, the age effective, OK? So assume I want to write the energy density of entropy right now. There are some prefactors, the pi to the fourth, blah, 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 that I can write down. But then the real bulk of the information is this H effective times the CMB temperature cube, right? 
what is the age effective? I told you that only the relativistic species matter. Okay? So the only relativistic species right now are photons and neutrinos, maybe, or part of them. Okay, let's assume that neutrinos are massless for, the, for a second. So um, age effective right now would be written as 2g of the photons times t of the photons over t of the photons cube. So that's 1. Plus what? Plus the number of degrees of freedom in a neutrino, which is 2. Neutrino, anti-neutrino. And, and there is no uh, additional component. Okay, There is no right-handed neutrino, thermalized at least, times the number of neutrinos that you have, three species, times some statistical factor times the ratio of the temperature in neutrinos to the temperature of photons to the cube. And this number turns out to be 4.11 for, uh, for reasons that you could calculate with the tools I've provided. Okay? Um, it's just entropy conservation. And this is roughly 3.91. So immediately, by this simple, simple bookkeeping, you can estimate what's the entropy density in the current universe. It's not exact, because we didn't take into account of baryons and all the rest, but in reality, the entropy of the universe is dominated by the, the relativistic species. So I think it's time for dark matter to enter the scene. It's, it's, just, it's just a way to write down very simply thermodynamical quantities like the energy density of the plasma, overall energy density in the, the species in the universe at a given epoch. Nothing, nothing more than that. If you are willing to write down explicitly the integrals corresponding to those definitions, no need to introduce them. Okay? It's just a shorthand notation. You shouldn't think of it as anything fundamental. It's just uh, to simplify the calculation. So uh, I promise that I will describe some evidence for dark matter coming from astrophysics and cosmology. And uh, uh, I cannot avoid of, uh, starting with the traditional uh, evidence coming from one of my heroes, Zwicky. Uh, so Zwicky was a very uh, productive, uh, let's say, uh, physicist and astrophysicist. Uh, and he came up with a lots of very smart ideas. Uh, among other things, he discovered dark matter. Uh, he discovered, uh, basically, the, the supernova stuff. Uh, he, he made the association of supernovae with the, the sources of cosmic rays, in fact. And, uh, and it was not very well appreciated by the community. Uh, so for, for the rest of the talk, what I, what I, what I really uh, care about Sriki is these two big discoveries. One is that astronomers are spherical bastards, which means that no matter how you look at them, they are just bastards. <laughs> and a slightly more interesting one for the rest of the lecture is that he inferred a mismatch uh, in the mass of the uh, coma cluster. This is a cluster of galaxy. Uh, with respect to the mass he could infer from uh, uh, purely photometric arguments. So he just counted the, the number of galaxies he saw in this cluster. He knew how many stars are in a galaxy. I'm simplifying a bit, but that's the logic. So he could estimate from the luminosity of, uh, of these objects how many baryons there should be there, now we would say. And then he, he, he did something very smart, which was uh, uh, quite pioneering for the epoch. He used a, a mechanics theorem, the virial theorem, uh, applying it to a cosmological object, to an astrophysical object like the cluster of galaxies, to, to have an independent estimator for the mass of this object. And he found a mismatch. OK, so uh, this is the argument. I, probably I don't need to repeat you the, the, the virial theorem, but the argument is the following. If you have a system of bound objects, uh, so a so-called uh, virialized system, subject to conservative forces. Well, I can erase this one. Uh, if the, 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 the conservative force in, into 
we are talking about is the, the gravitational one, well, you have a relation that says that the, twice the total energy, the kinetic energy of your system plus the potential energy is equal to zero. There is here a prefactor that depends on the nature of the conservative force involved, but for us it's, it's fine. So you can estimate immediately the kinetic energy of your system. Let's assume that this is made of n objects of the same mass m. Of course you can generalize it. So twice the kinetic energy is nothing but n times m v square average. And then here you have what? You have the basically roughly, this is not exact, but roughly in the limit where n is large, the number of pairs is n square over 2 times g newton times n the mass over the average distance. And uh, no, this is quadratic. OK? This is 0. And from that, you can estimate the, the mass of the cluster, which is roughly n times m. OK? So you isolate that. These and these simplify. These and these simplify. Oh, sorry. I, I, I wrote it twice. These and these simplify. So at the end, you have that n times m is equal to twice average r. This is the intergalactic distance v square over g newton. Now, what you could estimate was the typical uh, spread of the velocity square from uh, spectroscopic uh, uh, arguments. And then you could also estimate the, the um, from angular uh, consideration and some distance estimator, he could estimate r. So basically, he could get an estimate of the total mass of this v-realized object. And he found that, you know, maybe he did some mistake, but he found some 400 factor difference between this method and the photometric method, uh, just counting the number of uh, luminous objects and summing up, OK? So this was the first uh, hint that there was something wrong or something missing in the account of the, the matter budget. And uh, of course, he had made some uh, mistake of, uh, uh, in the estimate. Uh, some mistakes he could have avoided. Some others were just inherent to the knowledge he had at the time. Uh, but nowadays, you still uh, study clusters to have evidence for, for dark matter. Um, in particular, you have much uh, um, more uh, advanced tools. You can use x-rays. You can use lensing, for instance. Uh, so why you can use x-rays? Galaxy clusters are very deep potential wells. So being the realized objects, it means that the kinetic, uh, the kinetic energies associated with these systems can be quite high, typically high enough for the electrons to radiate in the, by Bremsstrahlung, OK? So in the x-ray band. And uh, so you have X-ray image, images of these of this, uh, objects. And if you assume, for instance, um, uh, hydrostatic equilibrium, what I'm writing there is just uh, Newton's law for a spherical uh, system, uh, a continuum system. Well, basically, you can, you, you can use the, the brightness. So the number of photons, X-ray photons, coming to you as a proxy for the density. And you can use the temperature profile of your cluster um, as a proxy for the pressure. So you can basically um, uh, solve this equation for the mass as a function of distance. And again, nowadays, you get roughly a factor, say, seven more mass than uh, dosing gas, uh, which, uh, which is inferred. Okay? So in a certain sense, what, what these probes are telling you is that the potential well, it's too deep compared to the stuff, the visible stuff that you see. Again, another uh, instance of this missing mass problem. Till now, there is no new physics, nothing exotic involved, right? Uh, of course, there is even more spectacular proofs uh, through lensing. You can try to reconstruct from these nice images, you can try to reconstruct the distortion field, and you can try to, um, uh, to fit it, for example, to a model where you just have uh, concentration of masses corresponding to the galaxies. These are these peaks here, and you see a mismatch. 
OK? You really need some uh, continuum stuff, this kind of Gaussian that you see, in order to account for the pattern um, of deflection. And again, this is another way to probe um, dark matter. Um, perhaps you have even more spectacular signals, which are uh, what I call segregation. No racial uh, uh, meaning here. It's just that you have clusters of galaxies that just go through each other. There is a collision. And uh, uh, most of the mass of, uh, uh, in these clusters, is, in fact, is in, in the gas. It's not in the stars or, or the galaxies. Uh, but since you have very fast uh, moving uh, gas uh, fronts, this, what happens is that this gas gets shocked. It gets shocked and slows down. Mm -hmm. And uh, while the rest of the cluster goes through each other, the, the cross section is very low. Now you can map through lensing for instance, you can map where most of the mass is, the distorting mass, the gravitating mass is. And uh, you can map through x-rays where most of the uh, hot gas, the shocked gas is. Okay. Now, if gravity in these objects is due to the stuff we know about, the gas, the lensing map should fall just on the top of the gas map. Okay. If the gravity is due to something that doesn't care at all, about the shocked gas, then a pattern should be different. And the blue curves, uh, the blue uh, uh, spots here are the ones reconstructed through, through lensing. I think this is the train rack, and this is the bullet cluster. Uh, and the, the, the pinkish one is the shocked material. So you, you, you see this kind of segregation of the two components. The gas, the baryons, remain in the shocked part at the center. And what gravitates, the bulk of what gravitates, goes through. OK? Now, this is, yes? <laughs> Actually, uh, this depends on the, um, it's, it's a very interesting question, because it depends on modeling these systems, in a sense. So you should have an idea of several things, like, uh, like the, um, the velocity of these systems, and also the, um, the geometry. OK? But in general, these, these are. These are rare objects that happen through, uh, I don't know how many of them that have been discovered, but a handful of them. But uh, in order for, I, th I would say, the, the interesting dynamical quantities, if you try to estimate uh, how many such collisions you should have seen in the history of the universe, probably you get a number like uh, 10 or so. So it, this, is, this is not the most common the beast in the universe. Uh, it's quite rare. In fact, I think at the beginning, uh, there were people that said, in fact, these objects were a proof that Lambda CDM was, uh, was in trouble, right? And that was more from the speeds. Yes, yes. But, um, so I, I wouldn't say that these are uh, typical beasts in a um, cold dark matter plus Lambda uh, uh, object. But I think pictorially, they are quite impressive. OK? Yes. In these collisions, the gas is, is out of the potential wells, right? So what is out? Say it again. The gas is not of the potential inside the potential well. Well, the hypothesis is that it started uh, yeah. with it because we see isolated clusters and we see that the two centroids agree. Yeah, but in uh, this case, how do you estimate the, the gas temperature? Right, but you, you just see the distribution of, for example, the, the X-ray photons. They just don't come from the region where, where the, the lensing potential comes. Uh, now, you, I think, I mean, locally, it's in equilibrium. The, if the question is, the, do they have the same temperature all across, the answer is no. I don't think it's a fully thermalized object. In fact, you can isolate different subsystems which have different properties. But, um, and the potential is not the same here and here. But for the, for the qualitative point of the argument, you don't care. Finally, you have fl flat rotation curves, which, well, not finally. I will have a more interesting uh, argument in favor of the existence of dark matter. Um, you have flat rotation curves. Again, the, the, the basic properties is well known. If you write down Newton force for a circular uh, orbit, so you equate uh, the gravitational force to the, to the uh, centripetal. 
uh, acceleration times mass, uh, what you observe is the rotational velocity is roughly constant, uh, but if you have a, a, a distribution of mass which is strongly peaked toward the center, the inner part of a galaxy, well, you should expect that the, the velocity square goes like 1 over r, uh, just like in a Keplerian system. So uh, instead, uh, you, you get this constant uh, behavior. This is one of the, uh, the plots of this behavior of rotational velocity versus distance. And uh, um, if you try to fit what kind of distribution of mass uh, gives you uh, this, this law, roughly you have something that goes like 1 over r square at sufficiently large distances. Um, now, this is historically very important. Uh, thanks to the work of people like Vera Rubin, Rubin and, and others, uh, for reasons that I still uh, have hard time to understand. But after these observations, people be started becoming convinced that dark matter is, uh, is for real. Uh, honestly, I still think this is one of the weakest uh, uh, points for, uh, for uh, uh, the convincing yourself that what you are seeing is, uh, is dark matter of non-baryonic form and whatnot. Uh, in fact, this is very important for phenomenology because, uh, for example, if trying to determine this, this, uh, uh, this extra component in our galaxy, trying to determine the local amount of this stuff, and so on and so forth, is very important for both direct detection uh, uh, strategies and indirect detection strategies. But at the end, is a result of a complicated process where you have to fit for the contribution of uh, of the, 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 the gases, the, um, the, the gas, the stars, the bulge, and so on and so forth. So uh, this number is still affected by quite some uncertainty. Uh, I think much more convincing is a point that was raised even uh, this morning, namely that uh, um, the growth of structures would not be possible, and even the pattern that you see in CMB would not be possible without dark matter. So uh, you will have more advanced notions on structure formation, even in this lecture. So I will just summarize the key uh, physical argument. If you look at this picture, uh, you, you, this, is, this is a misleading picture, because in reality, what you are seeing are anisotropies at the level of 10 to minus 5 or so on the top of a very uh, uniform sky, uniform brightness sky. So the level of these fluctuations at the recombination time was really at the level of 10 to minus 5. Now, you can do a calculation trying to estimate by today, by gravitational instability, if you just had baryons, and baryons we know, they interact with electrons, they interact with photons, so at the time of the recombination, they should have shared the same level of uh, fluctuations. If you just let them evolve, is there enough time to form the structures we see around us? And the answer is no. Okay? And... Uh, um, of course, unless relativity is deeply flowed. So uh, uh, the, the easiest explanation, and I think it's quite beautiful explanation, is that what happens is that uh, there is something decoupled from photons that somehow has deeper potential wells. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as baryons uh, get freed of the, their, their uh, spring uh, with, with photons, actually they can fall in this deeper potential well and evolve since. So uh, in slightly more uh, technical terms, but still uh, only pictorial, you can study, for example, the evolution in time of a mode. So you just write the density contrast. You divide the density time uh, by the average density, minus 1. You write in a Fourier uh, transform or series, in this case, for discrete modes. And then in a linear level, these evolve independently, each mode it evolves independently, and what I'm showing here is in arbitrary units the evolution versus time, if you wish, or one over z, one plus z to the minus one. Uh, forget what happens very early on. Uh, once the mode enters into causal contact, uh, what happens? I'm showing here the baryons in green, the photons in red, and the cold dark matter in blue. Is that cold dark matter starts evolving first? Uh, logarithmically, in fact, in the radiation uh, era. This is sometimes known as Mezaro's uh, effect. And then uh, linearly. Instead, the baryons, actually, they, they are coupled with, uh, this mode is coupled, of course, with, uh, with photons. 
and this is nothing but a manifestation that uh, you have sound in your, in your plasma. But as soon as the, the photons and the, and the baryons decouple, this is the recombination epoch, the truth is that the density contrast of dark matter is way, way larger than the density contrast they should have had if there was no dark matter around. And so baryons immediately start tracking dark matter. So the fact that we have structures of the level we have today doesn't seem compatible with this picture and only baryons present around. OK? So in fact, you can, you can uh, uh, compute what the pattern should have been of the power spectrum, which is the variance of this uh, uh, mode. And this is the result, this red curve. And uh, the black points is what has been observed by surveys. So you see that there is a mismatch, both in terms of amplitude and clearly in terms of shape. OK, so um, to me, this is one of perhaps the most convincing argument that there is dark matter around. And, the answer, and you might say, OK, but maybe gravity is wrong. OK, I should modify dramatically gravity. Correct, but you still have to deal with these bumps. And you don't see these bumps there. And some people have been arguing, yeah, but maybe there is some issue with observations and blah, blah, blah. The truth is that you do see the bumps. These are called baryon acoustic oscillation. So we are capable of seeing the subleading bumps due to the baryonic fraction. I doubt that we should have missed the <laughs> factor uh, of several bigger bumps just be because we did something wrong in the, in the sampling strategies or window function and whatnot. So in reality, even if you modify gravity, and there have been proposals to modify gravity like Tevez and so on, uh, it's much easier, so to speak, to boost this than to change the shape, which is not surprising physically. It's much easier to have additional effects on the top of gravity that we know, but to undo electromagnetism of baryons, this is very hard. You should have something that cancels the electromagnetic interaction of, of baryons with photons. Okay? So to me, this is very, very convincing. Um, I also propose in, uh, in the rest, and I leave it in the slides, some little exercise. If you haven't done it, or if you won't do it in the next uh, days, uh, to play with uh, basically even Newtonian physics, Euler equation, continuity equation, Poisson equation, and convince yourself that what I've just told you qualitatively uh, can be done more quantitatively. For example, consider a, a, a smooth background with this equation. Uh, linearize the equation for small perturbation about the smooth, uh, the smooth solution. Uh, do this in Fourier space. Uh, and then generalize to, to multi-fluids. Uh, Ask yourself which kind of perturbation grow and when. What happens in radiation-dominated epoch and in matter-dominated epoch. Uh, and uh, you will find some critical uh, quantity. Most likely you have seen this before and you will see it again. But if you haven't done that yet, please go through it. It's a very instructive exercise. You find it done on any cosmology textbook or notes or whatever. Uh, but this convinces you that what I've told uh, can be done in a much more quantitative way. Um, and then uh, let me mention that the same problem that we have with uh, large-scale structures today, you also have in the, in the CMB anisotropy pattern itself. Okay. If you do not plug in uh, cold dark matter, you are in trouble fitting the shape of the, of the peaks. And uh, uh, this is relatively new, in the sense that a decade ago, you could still try to, given the quality of the data that you had, uh, you could still try to fit with alternative models. Okay, this is one example uh, I, I take from a paper by Scordis et al. In reality, uh, already a few years ago, this, this game was completely hopeless. Just to give you an example, these are data coming, I think, from uh, WMAP7. Huh? The data, the black line would be the updated version of this Mondian modified gravity fits, and, uh, and, and the dotted line is the lambda CDM with cold dark matter. Clearly, you have a trouble, especially fitting this third peak. Uh, on the top of that, uh, you are not really free to alter too much the baryon abundance uh, in alternative models of, uh, uh, of the CMB 
formation, pattern formation because you have another independent measurement of the amount of variance around that comes from primordial nucleosynthesis, and they match very well. So in reality, you have a consistent picture in cosmology in lambda CDM, and you don't, as far as I know, in any other model. So why is uh, this cosmological imp uh, evidence important for, for um, particle physics now? Uh, it's based on linear solution or even exact solution or smooth component. So uh, you don't have to deal with many um, astrophysical uncertainties, okay? Uh, and it suggests that you need some additional species that gravitates normally rather than known species that gravitate anormally. Um, and then, because of arguments like this match between BBN and CMB and, and so on and so forth, uh, it does suggest you that you need some dark matter which is not known, uh, is, is some form which is unknown. It doesn't couple with photons the way baryons do. So it's hard to conceive that it can be hidden in, say, collapsed objects like Jupiters or whatever you can think of, uh, golf uh, balls or uh, waste in, in space and whatnot. Why? Because at that time, there was no virilized objects. There was no collapsed objects. And so uh, we have probes of this linear regime that tells us that there is this mismatch. Uh, there is one option left, which is uh, really black holes. Uh, so the, uh, the population of black holes with, um, of primordial origin, by the way, um, could, in principle, explain uh, um, dark matter. Uh, actually, current bounds put these under strong tension. So um, you have really to arrange for it uh, in a peculiar way, and uh, in general, you have to play a lot with your inflationary model to, uh, get, to get a distribution of black holes that evades uh, current bounds. And still, if you have to play with multiple fields in inflation and so on and so forth, at the end, you need new physics. So uh, it's just trading one evidence for new physics for another one. But there is no obvious way to have uh, primordial black holes of the right uh, properties. And by the way, this is a testable, uh, this is a testable statement. So in, probably in 10 years from now, we will, need, we will know if it's black hole or not. So. Um, the only possible standard model candidate um, in terms of uh, basic properties, which is, for example, stable on cosmological time scales, which is not electromagnetic charge, and so on, are neutrinos. Now, as uh, David Weinberg told us this morning, uh, in the 80s, massive standard model neutrinos were a, a proper candidate for dark matter. They were a serious candidate for dark matter. Uh, but they do not work. And again, why they do not work, this is some recent advance. Uh, uh, but let me just pause one second to say that the fact that nothing we know about, in a sense, works, is what gets many particle physics excited. Because as far as we know, when we study data from Tevatron, LHC, uh, LAP, or precision experiments, everything works very well. <laughs> So this is one of the few cases where it seems that we need some ingredient that we, we have no clue about. Okay? So, and this is why um, it's one of the signals of physics beyond the standard model of particle physics plus gravity that we know. And uh, uh, don't be surprised that many people work on it. Okay? So one word on why uh, neutrinos do not work as dark matter. Uh, of course, I told you that dark matter must be massive, otherwise it wouldn't uh, behave as, uh, uh, you know, baryons without charge, in a sense. Um, and in fact, we know that neutrinos are massive. We have measured uh, uh, transition from neutrinos of one flavor into another flavor, neutrino oscillations that uh, require neutrinos to have masses. At least uh, two states uh, must be massive. Uh, and this is fulfilled. So one thing on the scorecard is there. However, quantitatively, the level of mass they have is not enough to match the level of uh, extra mass that we need to account for dark matter. And by the way, uh, this is a calculation we will do uh, on lecture two. Um, and um, just to say that the mismatch is of a factor of several and uh, uh, way too big to be accounted for by statistical uh, errors. There is a, a slightly more, um, uh, I would say, deeper reasons why neutrinos do not work. 
and they are not the right kind of dark matter in order to explain the, the, the pattern of structures that we have. Okay? And uh, uh, again, this was mentioned this morning. Perhaps you will see something more on that in uh, um, uh, perturbation theory for uh, large scale structures. If not, I will show you a movie at the end to show you that really the two things do not look like, do not look the same. So uh, if I had to condense one important number that we have come about uh, um, in studying these probes, uh, it's the same number uh, David Weinberg showed you uh, this morning in his list of fundamental questions to address is to explain why you have this amount of cold dark matter. This is nothing but the den energy density of these additional species in units of the critical energy density uh, of the universe. So you would like to explain this number. Now, uh, you can, from, from a theorist's point of view, it's better to rewrite this number in terms of something um, that we can compute from uh, first principle. So I told you this is nothing but the ratio of the density, energy density of dark matter over the critical energy density times h squared, the reduced Hubble constant squared. Now, the energy density for a non-relativistic particle is nothing but the mass of this particle times its number density. Okay? Now, the, the number density of the particle I can rewrite as the entropy density. Okay, they scale the same, remember, T cubed. So this is fine. It's just a numerical factor between the two. I could have used this as a variable. It's just historical that people try, tend to work with, the, with the, the number density of particle over the entropy density. Okay. So once you plug in numbers, I can write down this S. Remember, it's just n numbers times this, uh, this factor that I can compute times T cube of the CMB. So the only unknown in my omega uh, X is the mass of my particle and this abundance, dimensionless abundance, normalized to the total entropy density. Okay? So I must find a combination of mass and abundance such that this number equates what is observed. And this we will do in uh, lecture two for a few cases. It's not the only goal of uh, dark matter theories, but it's one goal. I mean, dark matter should at least account for dark matter observed, which looks fair. So uh, just a few properties that you can deduce from observations. Okay, uh, from observation here, I mean really cosmological and astrophysical observations, not involving a priori anything but gravity. Uh, so uh, I, a few years ago, I had to, to teach uh, some basic notions for dark matter physics, and I realized that I, I didn't talk at all about this, and I realized that the audience was unaware of these points. And uh, uh, I tried to track back this, this, this issue because to me, th this was like lecture one in dark matter physics. And the reason is that they are trivial now. So trivial that nobody talks about them anymore. And, uh, 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 but I think it's useful that you see it at least once. The first property is that, I, I will grow through them, okay? The first property is that dark matter is dark which looks uh, surprising, perhaps, and dis dissipationless, which means that it cannot cool, for example, by emission of uh, photons, or uh, analogous to that. Um, now, why I'm insisting on that? Because you do find dark photons, you do find collisional dark matter, and so on. Be careful. You should always fulfill some basic requirements. Dark matter should be dark, and should not cool, at least not cooling too fast. Otherwise, you are in trouble with some observation. Which kind of observation? For example, dark matter forms something which is consistent with triaxial halos. It doesn't form disks. Now, baryons have the possibility to cool, and they form disks. If dark matter had dark photons of the same type of the baryonic counterpart that we know about, the same would happen for dark matter. But this is inconsistent with the gravitational potential shape that we, we know about. Okay? So even if they have, they must be quite different from the, 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 the baryonic counterpart. It's not just a copy of baryons. Okay? Um, it's also collisionless, at least collisionless uh, with respect to the baryonic counterpart. 
And you have a number of arguments uh, uh, entering into that. Not all of them have the same degree of robustness. But for instance, from uh, objects like the bullet cluster, you can set a limit on the uh, collisionality of dark matter. If they were very collisional, uh, collisional, they would not pass through each other. They would just uh, stop uh, like the gas does. Okay? Um, roughly speaking, these bounds, okay, some bounds depend on uh, some assumed velocity dependence of the cross section. But just to give you some ballpark number, uh, are of the order of the barn over GV, which for particle physics standards is quite high. However, if you compare with typical cross-section you find in atomic physics, in molecular physics, which are three, four orders of magnitude bigger than that, it's quite small. Okay? Again, dark matter is not a copy of the baryonic world. It should be quite far away from it. And uh, you get new bounds. on. The, there is a whole industry now uh, getting bounds on dark matter collisionality and the cross-section. And there are sometimes claims that maybe there is some effects that looks like collision of dark matter and so on and so forth. But again, even if at some point, each one of these um, properties that I'm listing here, it's darkness, uh, it's uh, non-collisional you know, non nature, etc. at some point might become a detection of a property, right? Uh, however, the message to keep in mind is that even if dark matter is collisional at some point, it's far enough from the baryonic counterpart properties that it requires some qualitatively different explanation. Okay, so uh, once I realized that, I felt uh, much more uh, relaxed because I don't know about you, but when I was a child, I loved dinosaurs, right? Everybody loves dinosaurs. And I couldn't bear the, 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 the thought, you know, that dark matter had anything to do with killing the dinosaurs. So don't worry, okay? Dark matter did not kill the dinosaurs. And uh, uh, so when you see papers appearing, read the fine print, please. So maybe there is a fraction of the dark matter which is made of something that looks like baryons. When I say a fraction, maybe it means 1% of it, something like that. And then maybe that fraction forms disks even thinner than baryonic disks, and so on and so forth. And maybe this triggers catastrophic events in over geological time scales. And so if you're happy to call uh, dark matter one per mil, 10 to the minus 4, even 10 to the minus 2 of dark matter, fine. But in a certain sense, we already have discovered dark matter of that sort, which are neutrinos. Neutrinos do contribute to dark matter and do contribute at that level, right? So. If you say that dark matter is responsible for, the, for the, uh, killing the dinosaurs, it's more or less like saying that neutrinos are responsible for large-scale structures. Hmm? Um, another property is that dark matter is smoothly distributed. Uh, um, what I mean is that it's not really made of uh, some discrete big junks of stuff. And uh, you can put limits on uh, the, the, the size or the mass of these objects from a number of astrophysical observables. So again, these limits do, do not look very impressive from a particle physics point of view. I mean, the, the ma dark, dark matter mass should not exceed, say, tens of solar masses, which is a quite a big particle. But uh, uh, still, they are non-trivial on astrophysical uh, scales. And in fact, there have been searches for, uh, for uh, uh, effects induced from uh, lensing effects, microlensing effects, which are uh, uh, enhancements of luminosity transients due to the fact that between you and an observed star, there is some lens. So if, the, if this star passes through your field of view, the same for the lens, basically you may get some magnification as a function of time. And this magnification has a peculiar uh, shape. It's a so-called Pachinski uh, shape. So you may look for these events, and in fact, towards the Magellanic Cloud, as it has been done. And in fact, they have been found. And you may look for the frequency of these events and try to estimate the, the, the fraction of dark, massive, compact objects of, say, stellar size or uh, planetary size that are there. And uh, um, basically, the results is here. You exclude everything, for example, the Hero survey uh, I've excluded everything which is above this, this curve. This is a curve of the fraction of dark matter that can be in objects of this given mass decade. Just to give you, an, this is in solar 
uh, masses. So this is roughly solar mass. This is a few solar masses. And uh, uh, basically, you see that for objects up to, say, 10 solar masses, and this bound goes to 10 to 26 gram, which I think it's like 10 to the minus uh, 6 or 7 solar masses. Well, it excludes that they can constitute the bulk of dark matter. So anything which is more or less between, say, Earth size and solar size or 10 times so the sun is excluded as being the dark matter. Uh, it's also true that dark matter is classical on uh, galactic scales. What do I mean is that uh, uh, um, it's not a quantum delocalized uh, um, phenomenon, at least at scales up to the kiloparsec. Uh, which, uh, through basic quantum mechanics, also imposes a. Uh, there is a question. Ah, sure. How do you know? Ah, uh, this is not because of dark matter. This is because uh, of we we have, we make the hypothesis that we do not want to modify Einstein gravity, and then you have the equivalence principle. Of course, you could have models where both you have dark matter and you modify gravity. Uh, so just because of quantum mechanics and the fact that we know that uh, it is localized over kiloparsec size, you get a bound, a remarkable bound, that the particles constituted dark matter must be high, uh, heavier than 10 to the minus 22 electron volt. So they must be uh, lighter than 10 to the say, uh, minus 7 solar masses and must be heavier than 10 to the minus 22 electron volt. This is just how clever theorists are, right, to narrow down the search. And uh, for fermions, however, the, the bounce is much stronger, and the reason is just related to the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, just this distribution there, well, you see that there is a plus 1 here. So basically, you can prove that... Uh, uh, it's equivalent to say that you cannot have, uh, pack as many uh, fermions as you want in the same state. And uh, uh, you cannot have the equivalent of Bose-Einstein condensation, which means that in phase space, you have a bound. And in fact, you can also prove that once you coarse grain uh, your phase space volume, the distribution function in a coarse grain sense, in an average sense over bigger cells, um, uh, still has to fulfill this bound. OK? So even if you do not know how the uh, uh, particle uh, phase space density of dark matter evolves in time after its production, you know that it cannot exceed these primordial values set by the Fermi-Dirac equilibrium uh, distribution that you can compute uh, safely. And roughly, this tells you that this is uh, known as Tremaine uh, bound. And uh, the modern version gives you a lower limit of around 0.4 keV for the mass of dark matter. And uh, uh, as I told you, dark matter is not hot. And even this morning, there was uh, some uh, historical remark about that. Uh, it means that it cannot have a relativistic velocity distribution. This is equivalent to say it's, it's, it must be sufficiently cold. OK? Um, and uh, um, in fact, this is the most profound reason why neutrinos are not good dark matter candidates. And the reason is that they have decoupled when they were hot enough. So uh, in a sense, they, are, uh, they have a uh, kinetic energy, which is sufficiently big to make them fly through uh, uh, the potential wells of, say, baryons. So they do not sink into sufficiently small um, uh, virilized objects, at least not early enough. And that makes them uh, very, very bad uh, in, uh, in uh, um, generating the pattern of structures that we see. Uh, so maybe I can show you one movie. This movie shows the evolution of uh, structures in a cold dark matter universe and in a universe which is hot dark matter. And you see clearly that this is much richer in small scale structure than this one. This is like a smoothed version of that. And we do see small scale structures. So neutrinos cannot make dark matter, a good dark matter candidate, because of this property. But we know more. Any particle that has a velocity distribution which is semi relativistic is not a good dark matter candidate because it would produce something very, very similar. Okay? So it's not the right 
um, if you wish, it's not the right power spectrum, for instance. And these are quite massive neutrino, by the way, at the, at the edge of being excluded by direct, uh, by direct searches. So I will just summarize. Um, there is a number of observations that um, all conspire to, to tell us that there is some ad the need for some additional degree of freedom that seems to gravitate um, normally, but maybe uh, there are uh, exotics even in the, in the gravity sector, uh, but must have suppressed coupling, suppressed coupling with respect to electromagnetic ones to strong interactions. Um, and uh, it, it seems that this requires some new physics beyond the standard model that we know about. Um, and uh, this explains why people are so excited about dark matter in the particle physics community. Uh, unfortunately, gravity is universal. So gravity tells us some of its properties, but cannot tell us the whole story. In the sense, if you want to identify the particle physics behind it, you need to go through some uh, interaction that discriminates among different classes of particles. Okay? Um, so why do we call neutrinos neutrinos? We call them neutrinos as opposed to the charged leptons because they do not undergo electric uh, charge interaction. So we, we need something similar for dark matter. Uh, however, uh, what I told you today is more or less uh, the, as far as you can go without building a, a real theory of it. If you want to search for something you don't know about, you need a framework within which to search, to begin to search. Okay? So all the rest somehow depends on a, a theoretical bias. Uh, and in lecture two, I will uh, define some theoretical context in which this search can be performed. I will start explaining you the kind of search that you can do, direct searches, and later on, indirect searches. Um, however, please decouple the evidence for dark matter, the need for dark matter, for the specific validation of a theoretical framework. If SUS is not found at LHC, it doesn't tell us much about dark matter. It doesn't invalidate the need for dark matter. If you do not find extra dimension, the same. We still have to solve this problem. We hope we will have to solve it with some input from colliders, but maybe we only have, we will only have access to partial information. Okay? So I think I can stop here and maybe if there are questions I can answer. <laughs> So uh, my question was, your, you assert that dark matter is smooth, but when we are looking at the Milky Way halo, we see these dwarf galaxies. Yeah. So maybe they, are, they have the host of subhalo substructures. And so right. it seems that the dark matter is clumpy. Why are you? Oh, sorry. Was, I did a mistake. No, it, it's, wait, it's a matter of scale. Wait, I need the pointer, right? Uh, it's a matter of scale. I just used an order of magnitude. Uh, uh, argument, which is kiloparsec. So roughly, you cannot have um, a delocalization on scales much larger than the kiloparsec. Otherwise, for example, you wouldn't have a, 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 um, you couldn't attribute really a, a, a dark matter content to a single dwarf because it would be, you know, a delocalized objects over, say, 10 kiloparsec size. This is what I'm imposing here. Of course, you might be even stronger than that. It might be that if you have evidence for a profile in a dwarf, maybe this kiloparsec may be 0.1 kiloparsec. But it wouldn't push much your mass. So I think the argument I, I, I illustrated is perfectly consistent with uh, what, you, what we observe in dwarfs. Actually, it's even a bit looser. If, if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that perhaps we need to push even one order of magnitude below that, in the sense that we need a structure at below the dwarf's yeah. size. Yeah, I, I mean that we have this dark matter clumps, but they are not compact. That's why we don't see this microlensing effect. Wait, but wait, wait, wait. I, I didn't say that you only have a smooth distribution of dark matter. I just said it, it, it cannot be, um, in a certain sense, quantum mechanically, you have localized it over, over scale of that size, hmm? at least. It, it, it can clump on scales of 10 parsec. There is no problem with that. I'm just saying this, clump, this gives you a bound. Then uh, uh, I, I don't know if it's clear. 
other questions? There. So, a very naive question. Um, we have an infinite range of frequencies to observe, and we have observed them all. How can we be so sure that we are just not missing some particular band of frequency where the dark matter f photons coming from that would be there? That's why we, we try to open new windows in astrophysics, right? Uh, I mean, the answer is that we, we are looking uh, at, at the best of our capabilities. It's not only about photons, right? People have been building uh, neutrino telescopes. They are trying to build gravitational wave uh, observatories. And the reason is just what, what, what you just mentioned, right? The fact that we, we think we are familiar with some sky or some wavelengths or some messengers doesn't mean that we understand universe in all wavelengths or all messengers. But the answer is we don't know. And the only reason is to, to go there and build something. Other questions? Could you say a little bit more about why uh, primordial black holes have been excluded as a um, it's dark not matter candidate? A, it's a bit more complicated, so I, I'll try to, to, to draw maybe um, a graph. I should have reported it, Mary. So uh, my claim is that they are not really being excluded, um, but they are strongly disfavored unless you engineer for a model where they are not. Okay. Um, so the usual plot is, um, is something like that. Here you have mass of your black hole. And here you have some fraction of the possible contribution of this mass to the, the total dark matter content. Okay? So this fraction, when this is 1, if you had the delta Dirac of this sort, would mean that you have this black hole of that mass that make 100% of the dark matter. Okay? Now. Uh, you have a number of observations that go from, uh, I mean, a very um, large mass. I think it goes, uh, the, the killing argument is um, uh, spectral distortion in the CMB. And uh, uh, at very small mass, the killing argument is the, uh, the extragalactic gamma ray background. And the reason is that if the, ma the a black hole is too, too, too small, uh, uh, it will evaporate because of Hawking radiation over a lifetime which is uh, smaller with respect to the lifetime of the universe. So you should see a background of gamma rays. In, I mean, you can compute what's the typical uh, energy. And so you have this, this fraction here. But in between, there are like, uh, I don't remember, but maybe uh, 20 uh, decades or so, uh, or maybe 15 or so. Um, and uh, I think here the level should be maybe 100. Uh, 100 solar masses, or maybe I'm wrong, 1,000 or so. Anyway, so there is a number of observations there. One piece here is these uh, uh, microlensing surveys. And then you have other objects, for example, uh, if you have micro, um, this region is a bit difficult, but let's say it's, um, it's probed indirectly through astrophysics in the sense that if you, um, in general, it's through catalysis. So if a black hole uh, sinks in a, a white dwarf or a, 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 a neutron star, what will happen, it will uh, mutate it into a black hole. It will trigger a fast evolution into a black hole. And uh, uh, not, all, not all these bounds are based on that, but most of them are based on these kind of ideas. And so the fact that you have observed in an object with that density of dark matter, that number of objects, say neutron star, etc., puts a, a, an upper limit yeah, an upper limit to the amount of dark matter that can be done, uh, reside in this kind of black holes. Now, at the end of the day, maybe if you engineer a, what happens in typical mechanisms for primordial production of black holes is that you do not produce a spike, right? You produce them over some range of scales. And even if you do not produce them over some range of scales, the fact that they will accrete, for example, will uh, broaden this distribution. So in practice, what happens is that you can live with, with something which is maybe at the level of 0.1, but over a very large, very large meaning uh, maybe uh, several orders of magnitude in mass, five, six orders of magnitude in mass. Or you may need something very spiky 
and uh, uh, which you must make sure does not touch either this or this one by evolutionary phenomena. And I think there are a few models out there. One appeared very recently by Juan Garcia Bellido, for example. Uh, but what I mean is that in general, uh, either you write something like a spike randomly, or you write something which is very spread out, you tend to eat some of these bounds. So uh, you need to, to fine tune your theory to make something that works. The good news is that the most promising, as far as I know, I'm not an expert at all on this topic, but the most promising uh, window is this one. The one, let's say, between uh, uh, virus spectral distortion and uh, microlensing searches, say in the hundreds of uh, solar masses, 100,000 solar mass range. And the good news is that if you build a future experiment which can measure uh, spectral distortion of CMB, uh, one to two orders of magnitude better, which should be okay at least for um, Pixie uh, in, uh, in the United States, you should be able to test this scenario. But this, this is what I mean when they are almost ruled out. It's uh, uh, pre-existing models have been ruled out. A posteriori models after all these searches can still be constructed if you play a bit. There is one question there. I hope it's on dinosaurs. No? <laughs> I, I just want to ask if there is an observational uh, proof yes. that the, since uh, dark matter is cold, then it doesn't form uh, disks. And it's, uh, it, it's not because say. of hotness. It's because of um, the fact that it cannot really cool down. So you have um, what we think we understand about the shape of this potential is that uh, uh, they are not pressure, pressure supported. They are supported by the, disper the velocity dispersion of your uh, uh, dark matter system. Now, if you had, uh, if you had any, any uh, way to cool down, like photon emission, what will happen is that you will just change the, 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 the shape of your potential because the distribution of dark matter would be geometrically different. Okay? So uh, one obvious way to see it is that imagine that you had a, a galactic disk like that and then you add a huge potential of dark matter like that, you would have strong tidal effects there and there. In fact, you would not even form the galaxy the way you, you see it. And uh, um, so, yes, you, you do have observational evidence that dark matter cannot be too far away from, say, triaxial or spherical, almost spherically distributed over uh, galaxies. And... Uh, if you could dissipate uh, through emission of photons, you would just basically full form disks because this is the configuration where you, uh, you cannot get rid of your angular momentum, but you can still uh, sink into this most stable orbit compatible with your angular momentum. So uh, this is a generic phenomenon. If you have a cooling process, yes, you do form disks. And it's not consistent with observations. Uh, actually. Actually, we did found some, uh, there is some claims that there is more dark matter in dwarf galaxies. There is more dark matter in? In dwarf galaxies. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's, for uh, that's, that's uh, come with what sure. you're saying. So, the, no, 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 the, the, wait, let, let, let's agree on term. The, the ratio of mass to luminosity is higher in yes, dwarf in galaxies dwarf. than in ordinary galaxies. In, uh, this, yes. this is, but this is not, uh, um, I mean, this, I don't this, think this, this goes with because dwarf galaxies aren't uh, so much as a uh, disk. This, uh, this, um, this also goes into this direction. I, I'm not sure. I mean, this has more to do, the way I understand it, this has more to do with the... Uh, in fact, this is a, a common trend. The, the mass to luminosity ratio or luminosity to mass ratio is not the same for objects of different type or different mass. But this, this is not uh, um, related. Uh, uh, this is more associated to the history of these objects, their, their, the way they form and the way they evolve, rather than uh, uh, fundamental properties of dark matter, as far as I know. For example, for dwarf galaxies, we do not think that this uh, ratio is due to some strange property of dark matter. As far as I know, the, the standard explanation is that uh, the, the potential well is so shallow that basically as soon as you have uh, 
baryonic effects like stellar explosions and so on, you get rid of most of the gas. And so at the end, even if they are born with the same ratio of baryons to dark matter, even if, uh, you would soon uh, end up in a, region, in a situation where you are dominated by dark matter. In fact, we think that most of the halos are really dark. They do not host uh, any visible uh, dark, um, sorry, baryon uh, stars or gas and so on. But this has more to do with bias than to, to um, fundamental dark matter properties, as far as I know. Okay, so I think we can uh, thank Pasquale.